1972. But, and this is very important, in 1972 we were below the limits. Population and the use of energy and materials was below long-term sustainable possibilities. So in 1972, the main objective was to slow down, try to reduce population growth and reduce the growth in the use of energy and material before we cross the limit. Now we're above. Now we're above the limit. And so the goal is not to slow down, we have to get back down. We have to bring population and the use of energy, material, generation of pollution back down under the limit. It will come down under any circumstances, if we act or not, and soon, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. In 1972, we thought that the peak of growth would occur around 2020 to 2040, something like that. And we still think so today, although maybe a bit sooner. The question is, will this reduction come because we act and deliberately bring it down through processes which we consider to be politically and economically and ethically acceptable? Or we will continue to ignore the problems and then the planet will force this growth to go down, but in ways which aren't very pleasant. Epidemics, warfare, starvation, I don't know precisely the mechanisms, but they wouldn't be the ones that we would pick. The thing is, we do not have the choice to continue growth. That's not an option. Now it's a question, how will it come down? New technologies are absolutely useful, although in fact we don't need radical technologies. If you look around the world, you can find in energy, in food, in environmental pollution, in water, most of the technologies that we need, only they aren't very widely used. Nonetheless, absolutely we should try to develop some new technologies, and I, I can give recommendations for that. But the key thing is, those technologies, even if we're very successful, will not avoid the necessity of cultural and ethical and institutional change. Because the problem is not technology. The problem is our cultural attitudes about growth. As long as we want growth, as long as we think growth is desirable, we will develop technologies which help us achieve growth. Of course. As soon as we want technologies that permit us to reduce the use of energy and materials, then we need to change our attitudes. Notice I speak about industrial growth and physical growth. It's not the same as GNP growth or human progress. Over the last 150 years, there's been a very strong correlation. When the GNP has gone up, normally the use of energy and materials has also gone up. It's not necessary. In fact, the Stern report explicitly says that we need to decouple, we need to increase development and reduce energy, and it's possible. We can talk about this during the discussion period. I have to say, personally, I don't think nations are going to deal with climate change. Why? It's a global problem. And you have this issue that it changes slowly, and if you do something here, you don't see the results very soon, and you don't get to keep all the benefits. So you have this so-called uh, free rider problem, or what you say in German, uh, Schrittbrett uh, far problem. Uh, and I think we won't solve it. We aren't solving it, and I don't think we will. But in Germany, and in many other industrialized countries, energy is going to become an enormously severe problem, much more serious than today. And in the process of dealing with that, if we do it right, we can also be helpful to the climate. So 
I'll talk just at the end about the difference between global and universal problems and make the case about energy and, of course, the, the twin problem, uh, dematerialization. Now, what did we really do? Uh, there have been a lot of statements about what we said and what we did back in 1972 both by people who liked our work and by people who didn't like our work. Unfortunately, many of them didn't read what we did on either side, the critics or the uh, enthusiasts. So let me tell you what I think we did. We did not prove that there are physical limits. We talk about physical limits, we give data, uh, but the data are very poor and data don't prove anything. If you think that technology will somehow automatically solve every problem, or if you think that God is going to come down to earth and take everyone away before the big problems come, or if you think that we're going to migrate to another planet, or if you think that there is in the market some mechanism to automatically slow down before we hit the limits, you won't be worried about limits. And my model isn't going to change your mind. What we did was to provide a tool for those people who think that physical growth can't continue in it forever on a physically finite planet. Some people don't believe that. Some people do believe that and the vast majority of people don't think about it. They just want to get up in the morning and get enough food and, and so forth. So this is actually a book for a relatively small fraction of society. For them, we showed that population and industrial growth are inherently, by their nature, exponential. It means they tend to go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, etc. Not linear, not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is an extremely important distinction. If things grow linearly and you double the size of a limit, you buy twice human history on this planet. If things grow exponentially and you double the size of a limit, you only buy one doubling time, which may be 10, 15, 20 years, not very much. So what we said was, although we don't know precisely where the limits are, when you have exponential growth, you will get there very soon. And in 1972, our analysis, which was very crude, seemed to say that we would get to many of these limits in the period 2020 to 2040. And then we also showed that the inherent structure of the decision-making processes in the planet mean that the dominant way to deal with limits is to overshoot and then collapse, not to come up in an orderly, asymptotic way to the limit. It comes from delays, erodibility, so we make the case for this. This is a big difference. Uh, Recently, I was in Vienna for three weeks. I often rode on the streetcars. I could get on a streetcar not seeing the driver, but supposing that the driver will, if he sees or if she sees an obstacle, slow down in a nice orderly way. So I didn't have to worry about obstacles. I could read my paper or I could look at my map or I could do something. Suppose someone tells me there is no driver or the driver is asleep or drunk, or crazy, then I would know that the streetcar probably, when it sees an obstacle, will hit it very hard. I would be nervous. In fact, if I could, I would get off the streetcar. We're telling you the globe is like a streetcar with no driver. There is no automatic mechanism to slow you down in an orderly way. Now, in 1972, we had to assert these things on the basis of theoretical calculations. As you'll see in a moment, now you read the daily papers, you look at the scientific reports, 
there is no longer any dispute about these issues among scientists. There are a lot of economists and a lot of politicians who don't want to believe it or just simply don't think about it. But amongst the scientists, there's really no longer any dispute about these things. And so, actually, although there have been hundreds of books and thousands of conferences on sustainable development since 1972, I think our book is still unique in talking about the dynamics of growth in a finite world.